Yo, what's good, YouTube? It's your boy, Introspective, and welcome to the Introspective Podcast. This is a new thing that I'm trying out in partnership over here on UCAS Studios, so make sure you subscribe to them so you can get all of the content. I'm going to do this once a week, 30-45 minute podcast, just discussing Nintendo, Smash, video games in general. If you want to ask me any questions, I'll tweet out every week when I'm gathering questions up at Introspective on Twitter, and... That's your chance to leave any questions that you have for me to answer on the podcast. So without further ado, let's just try this because I've never actually done this. So the first question comes from Dave Dute one and he says, Who would be your most wanted first party and third party characters for Smash? Personally speaking, I would like to see Crash Bandicoot make it in. Um, as far as first parties go, there's an array. But off the top of my head, I think that Maxwell from Scribblenauts would be really cool. I don't know how they would incorporate such a character, but the concept of Scribblenauts is just so cool. And I think that there's a lot they could do. And if you give it to someone like Sakurai, then I'm sure that he'll be able to make some sort of wacky moveset where he maybe he can pull out his notebook, kind of like, a, what do you call it, Heroes Down B, and you can pick different things that he can summon and all sorts of cool stuff. So I would definitely like to see Maxwell from Scribblenauts. Third party character, obviously, if you follow my Twitter, you'll know that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Steve being in Smash Bros. Now, I think Steve has just as much potential as Minecraft itself. If you've played Minecraft, you know that it's pretty much endless possibilities. And I think that can translate into a Smash Bros. moveset. Especially, once again, given to a man like Sakurai, I think that he would take the concept of Minecraft and really make it something amazing in Smash Bros. that's unlike anything else in the game, and he loves Minecraft. It's one of the few games he says that he's played more than once, at least in modern times. I'm not sure if he's, uh, you know, if it's the only game that he's played more than once because as we know he's a huge fan of like the Neo Geo era and everything but as far as like modern games goes and when he's busy with Smash Bros he's, he said that he's played Minecraft multiple times and he's really enjoyed it so I could see that love being translated into Smash he obviously knows a lot about the game if he's played it multiple times and I think that he could really inject some super creative ideas from Minecraft into Smash Bros, and I think that it would be just a collision of two titans. Take the Smash Bros franchise and Minecraft, one of the most successful games of all time, and just put them together. I think that would be huge for the series. I think that would be huge for Nintendo. It would make a lot of noise in the gaming world, and it would just be great in general for everyone who loves both Smash and Minecraft. Well, maybe not everyone who likes Smash, because there's obviously a lot of Steve haters, but... For the most part, I think people would think it's pretty cool to see. So thank you, Dave Dute, for that question. Uh, at Dob Dob YouTube says, How do you feel about the lack of Nintendo news at the moment compared to the trove of PlayStation and Xbox news right now, even if you don't count the news on the new consoles themselves? Well, I think that it's an unfair comparison to compare Nintendo to Sony and Microsoft right now. Because in the case of Sony and Microsoft, they have their next-gen consoles rolling out. And right now, they have to be, you know, rolling out tons of new releases, um, tons of new information. I mean, they're, they're going into the next-gen. They have to get the people hype. And Microsoft is actually uh, delaying Halo, which is some pretty big news for Microsoft. Um, that's going to definitely give Sony the advantage in the eyes of a lot of people, especially if they roll out with um, Spider-Man Miles Morales as a launch title. We don't really know what they're launching with yet. We don't even really know the prices or anything of these consoles. So there's a lot of reason for Sony and Microsoft to be pushing out all of these um, games and news and whatnot despite COVID because they kind of just have to. In the case of Nintendo, the Switch is in its third year now. Smash is out. Uh, Animal Crossing is out. It got some updates. They just released Xenoblade Definitive Edition, which was pretty big. 
Um, obviously not as big as, you know, Breath of the Wild 2 or Metroid Prime 4 or anything, but it's still a pretty big game in its own right. And Animal Crossing is a huge game. I mean, Animal Crossing is single-handedly carrying the Switch through 2020 right now. And I think that Nintendo should be showing more than they have because it's making the fans kind of antsy. And I've seen a lot of arguments. Oh, well, I'm a consumer and I paid for this console and so they should be providing me with games. Well, Nintendo has already provided us with games. I mean, there's plenty of things to play. The Switch doesn't revolve around Mario and Zelda, you know. There's plenty of other games to play, stuff like Astral Chain, um, even like the more niche games like Kingdom Battle, which I would highly recommend if you haven't played. That is a fantastic game. But there's a lot of, you know, cool things. You can get stuff like Skyrim, you can play Celeste. Um, there's all sorts of cool stuff on the Switch that you can have that holds you down right now. And if you can afford to, um, you know, a lot of people have more than one console. They don't really rely on just having one console because when there's a lull in the console, you know, you don't really have much to play. I personally also play PlayStation 4. So, you know, I had Final Fantasy VII Remake come out recently, uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which I haven't actually played yet, but I'm planning on playing. So I think that finding a balance is really important when trying to be patient because I think that Nintendo is going to roll out with a ton of content eventually, especially with the holiday season coming up. I mean, Nintendo always does big things during the holiday season. You know, Mario Odyssey, um, stuff like that. So Breath of the Wild 2, I don't think it's going to come out this year, but I'm sure we'll see more information on it around that time. And Metroid Prime 4, I'm convinced, doesn't even exist anymore. I know it does exist, and I know it went over to Retro Studios, but it just feels like it's just it's just never going to come to be. And I really hope that we see some news on it this year, because I love the Metroid Prime series. I think that it's something really unique for Nintendo. It's dark, it's gritty, it's, uh, it's just badass, you know? Like, Metroid is just a badass game. And it's a really nice... Um, how should I say it? Like, counter to all of the, you know, bright, fun, cutesy Nintendo shit that we all know and love. Like, the Marios and the Smash and all that kind of stuff. Kirby and even Zelda at times. Although Breath of the Wild does look pretty uh, dark. Breath of the Wild 2 looks a lot darker than the first one. And the first one, you know, it had a pretty uh, intense story and everything, but... um. I think that this one is really going to delve into like darker themes and stuff. So it looks cool. I'm really looking forward to that. But I think that Nintendo can afford to take a little bit more time than Sony and Microsoft at the moment. But again, I think that they need to come out with some new stuff sooner than later. Because the last Smash character we got was Min Min. And she was revealed months... Or not revealed, but... The news of her dropped several months ago, and then she came out, so... It's been a kind of a, you know, a little lull for Smash. Even though Small Battlefield just came out, and there was some online changes, you know... A big thing about the Rex is always a new Smash reveal, so I... I would hope that there is Challenger Pack 7 coming up. Um, I would love to see more on Breath of the Wild 2, because we know that's confirmed. And I would really like to see more Metroid Prime 4, but I... I really don't know what's going on with that game. Same with Bayonetta 3. The development seems really shady for that. Not not like shady, not like, oh, they're not doing it low-key or something. But like, they, they just keep saying, oh, it's coming along great, but they have nothing to show for it. So, I don't know. I don't know. The only thing that's really like keeping me sane when it comes to these kinds of things is Final Fantasy VII Remake, you know, it was revealed, it was shown, everyone was excited, and then for years, nothing. They were just completely in the dark, no news, nothing. And then all of a sudden, they started rolling out the completed game, and it looked phenomenal. And it is phenomenal, it's one of my favorite games. Um, it really lived up to the hype for me, personally. and. That's what I'm kind of hoping Metroid Prime 4 and Bayonetta 3 and even Breath of the Wild 2 are going to be like, you know, stay under wraps for a little bit, really get the games looking great, and then when 
it's closer to launch, you can start rolling out all the new content and stuff and really just blow us back. So, like I said, I think Nintendo has a little bit of time to go ahead and be a little lenient with their release schedule, but I think that a lot of people are really starting to get antsy. I mean, you just go on the Nintendo of America Twitter, every single thing they tweet, I mean, you'll look at the comments and it's, where's the Direct? Where's the Direct? Where's the Direct? So, you know. I think for Nintendo's sake, they should try to do more. But I think that they're really focused on quality this time around. And that's kind of what they've always done. So I'm not too worried about them. So thank you, uh, Dob Dob, for that question. Um, at TropTaz says, Did you have a game from your childhood that propelled you into gaming from that point forward? Or did you just like gaming in general? I really just liked gaming in general. As a kid, um, we had multiple consoles. We had uh, um, Genesis. We had uh, Super Nintendo. Um, we had I had Game Boy, the original Game Boy, where it was like five pounds. It was like a brick in your hand. The screen was like puke green, and you had to put four batteries in it just to play. I mean, those are those are the ancient times, man. But uh, yeah, we had that, and then we had um, we had PlayStation. PS1 and N64. That was kind of like all the stuff I had. And then as I got a little older into my teenage years, um, PS2 was really what held me down. But uh, back when I was growing up, like as a kid, playing all those games, I really just loved all of it. Um, Sonic, uh, 2D Sonic. Obviously, Mega Man was a huge thing for me. Um, Mario. Uh, Mario Land on Game Boy was my first, like, real Mario experience that I loved. And then, um, I really liked, um, A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening as well. Those were huge games for me. So, I had a taste of Zelda before, um, Ocarina of Time came out. And Ocarina of Time was really, like, when I truly, like, fell in love with gaming and was like, yes, this is, like... This is my hobby. This is what I really love to do. Ocarina of Time was a really special game for me. I loved Ocarina of Time so much. I still love Ocarina of Time. I know a lot of people think it's an overrated game or whatever, but I think it's one of the best games ever made. I think it still holds up today. I still love to play it. Um, I'm not good at speedrunning it. Oh, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> I have this cough, man. I had a COVID scare, actually. I had to take a COVID test and everything. Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah. So, I've been a little sick. I've been a little under weather. That's why I haven't been really, um, posting much on my main channel. But I will be getting back to that soon. But, as I was saying, um, Ocarina of Time was just a huge game for me. Um, Final Fantasy VII, as well, when that came out on PS1, that was mind-blowing for the time, too. That was, that was really, um, it was really cool to see, like, the transition of gaming. I got to grow up like seeing the transition of gaming from like the the 16-bit era into what we find or what is like the basis of modern gaming. You know, Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, stuff like that. And uh yeah, that's that's when I really truly fell in love with the gaming. Pokemon as well, obviously. Pokemon was, you know, my other favorite thing to play. So, I've had a love for Nintendo from the start. Nintendo has always been my favorite gaming company. They always will be. I mean, I I am straight up a Nintendo fanboy. Like, without question, I'm a Nintendo fanboy. I'll, I'll admit that. Um, I just love Nintendo, man. I've, uh, I've always loved Nintendo. And I actually didn't have GameCube growing up, because like I said, we were playing PS2, and that's why I played mostly. But then we got the Wii, and, um, you know, so many great games on there. Twilight Princess, Galaxy Games are obviously godlike. Um, you know, just so much good stuff. Mario Kart Wii, um, Mario Party 8 was a big game for me on the Wii. Uh, so, you know, I really just have played Nintendo my entire life. And it's just something I'm going to continue to do. And, you know, if I have kids, I'm going to pass on Nintendo to them. I'm really looking forward to, like... Just sharing my love for Nintendo with people. That's just what I enjoy doing. And that's why I love having a Nintendo YouTube channel. Is because 
I can just share that love with people, with fellow Nintendo fans. And I really think that Nintendo fans, while they can be whiny and complaining and everything, I think that we're probably the most passionate fan base when it comes to video games. Like, our loyalty to Nintendo, I don't really think that Sony and Microsoft fans, like, I don't think they're on, like, the same kind of, like, love. I mean, obviously they support their companies, you know, they love the games, but, like, there's just, there, there's, like, this whole nostalgia factor of Pokemon and Mario and Zelda and Smash and all these things. Like, Nintendo has really just created, it's like the MCU, man. Like, Nintendo has created this, like, amazing world and cast of characters that, like, we just have grown up with and we can recognize and everyone knows and everyone loves and it's just hard to hate Nintendo. It just really is, you know? So, Nintendo is really what made me a gamer and I strayed away from Nintendo for a little bit because I am a huge Sony fan, don't get me wrong, I, I, I love Sony. And I also had Xbox 360, so I, I've enjoyed all three companies. But, Nintendo will always be my favorite. So, yeah, if there's a reason that I got into gaming, it's it's Nintendo. It's the N64, it's the Game Boy. Those were really, like, the, the building blocks for who I am today as a gamer. Yeah. So, thank you, TropTaz, for that question. So, Francine10 asks, What was the most impactful Nintendo game you played? Man, there is a lot of games, but I'd say that, um, <clears throat> I'd say the Zelda series in general would be the most impactful for me. Like, just the whole sense of adventure and, like, it really just pushed the envelope with all of the things that it did. I mean, even on the Game Boy, um, Link's Awakening was one of the most ambitious titles on the Game Boy, if not the most ambitious game on the Game Boy, in my opinion. I think it was a lot more ambitious than Pokemon. Um, not to say that Pokemon wasn't, like, a huge thing, but Link's, Link's Awakening, like, there's just, there's just so much to it that makes it so great. And, like, the dungeons are great, the gameplay is great, the world is great. It has a really cool story, like, it's a unique story. Like, it's just... It's on a little tiny green screen, but, you know, it's so grand and epic. And that's just Zelda in general. Like, it's just epic, you know? Like, it just has an impact on you. You just, you play it and you just feel like a rush and exhilaration. It's like, man, this is like an adventure. So I think that the Zelda series in general really um, is the most impactful for me personally. Obviously, like I said, Ocarina of Time, like, really propelled forth my love for gaming um, playing that game was like, it was just an amazing experience, and it still is. I just, I like I said, I love Ocarina of Time, um, and then it's, uh, it's a follow up. Majora's Mask is is one of my favorite games. Period. It's my favorite Zelda game. It's um to me, it's the most unique video game ever made. Not in terms of like gameplay or anything, but just like. The whole world and style and like just the weirdness man like it's just it, there's nothing like Majora's Mask you know like you play Majora's Mask and you're transported to this world and you're just never gonna see anything like it and it's so immersive with the time travel mechanic and everything and you know and like all of the the crazy um uh, quests that you can do, like, they're so extensive, and, like, all the masks you can collect, the mechanics of changing with the masks to, you know, Deku Link, and Zoras, and Gorons, and it's just so cool, and the temples are insane. There's only four temples in the game, but all of them are really, really cool, um, especially the Great Bay Temple. Great Bay Temple is one of, I think the Great Bay Temple is harder than the Water Temple, in my opinion. I, I don't know if that's a hot take, but I think that in terms of just like pure puzzles and challenge, I had a way harder time figuring out the Great Bay Temple than I did the, the fucking Water Temple. So that's just me. I don't know. Um, Stone Tower Temple as well, I would say is harder than any temple in Ocarina of Time. 
but there's just so much cool stuff and I love Skull Kid. Skull Kid. I just I just resonate with that character, you know. I just I just really feel for that guy and uh you know, having Link be the young Link again was really cool like traveling back after Ocarina of Time and then like going on a new adventure as young Link, but you know, you're slightly older. I think that was kind of cool. There's just so many uh crazy things and then you know obviously you have games like breath of the wild which once again are like pushing the boundaries of what a zelda game can be with its huge open world and all the shrines and quests that you can do and the new combat mechanics i think there's some things about breath of the wild that are that were definitely lacking and maybe i'll get into that another time um but zelda for me has always been like the bar for Nintendo, in my opinion. I, a lot of people would say Mario is the bar or Pokemon, but I think that Zelda really truly is like, like it's just, it's Nintendo. Like I, again, most people would be like, oh, Mario is Nintendo. I think Zelda is like, when I think of Nintendo, I think of Zelda. I just, I love Zelda so much. It's by far, my favorite Nintendo franchise, and probably my second favorite franchise behind Final Fantasy. I I, I love Final Fantasy, um, and you know, we're talking Nintendo right now, so I really won't get into Final Fantasy, but that is definitely my favorite game series. But as far as Nintendo goes, yeah, Zelda has always had an impact on me. In fact, the only game that I really don't like is Skyward Sword. And I think that it just suffers from the motion controls. I think it's a it's a good game. It's got some good ideas. It, it's cool. It's uh, it's colorful. It's fun. But I think that the motion controls really held it back. And it was an ambitious idea for the time. But uh, that's really the only Zelda game that um, I really like. Wouldn't play again if you asked me to. Like over any of the other 3D games. So, yeah, I, I love Zelda. That's definitely the most impactful on me personally. Um, Paco Taco says, who is the worst DLC character so far in Smash? Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Once again, guys, I'm real sorry about this call. But this is raw and uncut. I'm just trying this out. And uh, hopefully I feel better next time. Um... I think the worst DLC character in general is Corrin. Uh, you know, in terms of hype, didn't really bring it. Um, obviously, Fire Emblem is not very well received at this point in the Smash community. And I don't really mind them being a Fire Emblem character as long as they're super unique and cool. Like, I think Byleth is sick. I really do. But I find Corrin extremely boring, um, especially in Ultimate. And, uh,. <coughs> Oh my god, you guys. I... Ooh. I'm really sorry. I am really sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely say that Corrin is my least favorite of the DLC characters. If I had to pick from the Ultimate DLC, I would say that, uh, unfortunately, in terms of gameplay, I would say Banjo. Banjo was my dream character. I was hype. I'm glad that they're in the game. But I'm just really disappointed in their gameplay, so I would say that they're like the most boring DLC character of, um, you know, Ultimate so far. I think the other DLC characters are all sick. So, um, let me see. I'm kind of just scrolling through these now. I thought I had enough questions for a 30-minute podcast, but, um, I actually didn't, you know? So, a little, little bit of growing pains. Oh! Um... Here we go. Smuggler YT says, why did you choose the name Introspective? Um, Introspective came to be, I used to play this uh, MOBA way back in the day. Oh, uh, not MOBA, uh, MMORPG, sorry. I'm thinking of League of Legends. Um, called uh, Doofus. It was a really weird, like, it was more like a niche MMO, I think. It was made by French dudes and a lot of French people play it, but it was uh, it was really cool. It was really fun And there was like this mage type character in the uh, In the game that I really liked his name was Zaylor's hourglass like all the characters were like They like all like worshipped a god and then like the god 
he like gave them their power. So this was Zaylor's Hourglass, who's a mage. And um, he was really cool. And uh, one of the ways that they described him, like in his character description, was that he was introspective. And I tried to name him that because I thought the word was really cool. And I'm kind of just an introspective person. Like I'm always like inward thinking. I'm always, you know, you know, like deep analyzing things and like maybe overthinking, you know, stuff like that. And uh, I tried to name him that, but the name was taken. So I spelt it the way that I spell my name now. And that's how um, the char my character's name was spelt exactly like that. And uh, it turned out to be a good thing because I used that as my YouTube name. And, you know, it, if I just made it the normal word, it might get lost among whatever. But to change the, uh, the lettering and everything, it made me uh, stand out from, like, the normal word. And, you know, I think it's, like, a unique thing. I think the word sounds cool. I think it describes me. And, uh, yeah. I like that people, like, before I even, you know really took off like people started calling me intro and i thought that was cool you know like they just like they came up with that nickname i never thought to just um you know abbreviate it i always thought people would call me introspective but then people started calling me intro and i thought that was really cool so now that actually i hear that more than introspective i'd say the majority of people probably like 90 5% of people who interact with me on Twitter or YouTube, they just all call me intro. I think that's really cool. I, I really like being called that. I, I think that's like a cool tag. So, yeah. Um, that's uh, that's how my name came to be. Uh, I had to make a quick cut there, actually. Sorry about that. My dogs started going ape shit, and they ruined, like, everything about the podcast. But if you guys are still listening, I really appreciate it. Let me know... What do you guys think of this podcast in the comments? Um, th like I said, this is all new to me. I'm kind of just rambling. So if you have any suggestions or advice or anything you'd like to hear different from the podcast, let me know. And uh, yeah, let's go to what I'm going to call the last question of the podcast. At Oracle says, what's your opinion on Nintendo fans having high expectations when people expect tons of first party announcements during the partner showcase? Um, I think it was extremely stupid for people to expect tons of first party announcements during the partner showcase. Literally said partner showcase. Nintendo's not a partner with themselves, so I don't understand why they wanted to see Breath of the Wild 2. Um, I think that Nintendo fans are just lost causes at this point. Not everyone, but like, you know, there's just there's just some people in this community who are lost causes and like they are just never ever going to be able to like accept that they can't pump out a new mario game every three months like they're just unhelpable i think it's best to just ignore them and have realistic expectations i think that the whole partner showcase idea is cool like these mini directs like sporadically happening is cool um i would personally like to see like a jam-packed nintendo direct i would rather get one like 45 minute direct than like you know three or four mini directs that are like eight minutes long that's just me um i would rather have like one jam-packed direct that has like all the heavy hitters all the big news that we want instead of like all these mini directs and random announcements too on twitter i don't know what nintendo's strategy is with that but they've just been dropping like some pretty big news out of the blue like Origami King is a big deal, and, you know, that was just announced out of the blue on Twitter, like, randomly. Same with the, uh, the new, um, Pikmin remaster that's coming out. Like, they just dropped that out of the blue. Like, I don't understand why they wouldn't put that in the direct, but, you know, it's their decision at the end of the day, and, hey, I'm just rolling with the punches, man. I'm just on the hype train, and I'm just seeing what they come up with. I think that people need to... Just have realistic expectations. It's okay to want Breath of the Wild 2, Odyssey 2, Galaxy 3, you know, all these big things, whatever. That's fine. But to expect them in an eight-minute partner showcase direct, you're just setting yourself up for disappointment, and it's just stupid, and I don't know why you would even do that to yourself. So, yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching today's 
watching. You know, I'm s I make I make videos, man. I, I'm t you know. Thank you guys so much for listening to my first podcast episode of the Introspective Podcast here on UCAS Studios. Make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. Like I said, I'll be doing this once a week. I think it's gonna be on Mondays from here on out. Um, like I said, I was sick, so I was a little behind with my schedule. So this is the first episode, and then the next one will go up early in the um, next few days, actually, because uh, it's going to be a new week. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, like I said, let me know in the comments what you guys think of this, uh, if there's any improvements you think I can make, and I'll see you all next time. Deuces.